perhaps you subscribe to this motto spoken by the great Linus Van Pelt to his friend Charlie Brown. There are three things I have learned never to discuss with people, religion, politics, and the great pumpkin. Well, the great pumpkin aside, many would like a church just like that, free of politics, perhaps even free of religion. But let me remind you, especially on this day of celebration, as we celebrate our Presbyterian heritage, the church is at its best, perhaps, when we engage disciples in living out their faith in all of human endeavors, relational, spiritual, emotional, educational, and even political, rather than practicing a life of disengagement. Our Presbyterian ancestors were deeply engaged in every aspect of life and in so doing transformed this world. Without the church's engagement in the world, there would have been no Protestant Reformation, no Puritans, no Pilgrims, no Revolutionary War even, as it was called the Presbyterian Uprising. Without our church's engagement, this world would have been a very different place. Well, today we continue our fall series on grateful living, grateful giving, remembering the amazing grace that God has made us beneficiaries of through the love of Jesus Christ. We've set before ourselves this working definition presented last week, grateful living is a humble recognition of our profound need for God's grace and a faith-filled response of worship, ministry, and life sharing. And I hope this week you've been considering the many blessings for which you can be thankful Have you reflected on those benefits much? The benefits of God's amazing grace, those that we underlined last week? Or let me remind you that without considering just how God has so blessed our life, I don't think that we can truly express the depth of gratitude that God deserves. Well, for this fall sermon series, we are exploring the book of 1 Timothy. It's a letter written by Paul to his apprentice, Timothy. And it gives us great opportunity to explore themes of gratitude. We're now in chapter 2. I encourage you to read the omitted parts on your own. But for now, we're verses 1 through 7. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and all who are in high positions, so that we might lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity. This is right and is acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. For there is one God, there is one mediator between God and humankind, Christ Jesus, himself human, who gave himself as a ransom for all. This was attested at the right time. And for this I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I'm not lying a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. My friends, the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. We go back now for a little history. The year is 1561. We find ourselves in the middle of the European Reformation. 
We're with John Knox as he has been summoned into the presence of Mary, Queen of Scots, to testify whether or not he should be tried for sedition, for riding against her authority, and for stirring up a revolution among the common people. In context, it was just 44 years prior that Martin Luther, enraged over what he perceived in the church as both infidelity to God's infidelity to God's word and injustice to the common people, posted his 95 theses on the castle church wall in Wittenberg, Germany, marking the official beginning of the Reformation. It was shortly thereafter that John Calvin experiences his own conversion and begins to teach and preach a similar message and theology of Reformation in Switzerland. And it's there in Switzerland that John Knox found his own voice and began to fight in his home for Reformation in Scotland, in England. Well, Knox, who had been summoned before the Queen, is not intimidated. It seems nothing intimidates John Knox. Queen Mary of Scots asks him, how can you teach the people to receive another religion than their princes can allow? How can that doctrine be of God, seeing that God commandeth subjects to obey their princes? Well, John Knox gave a lengthy reply, quoting various examples from biblical history of how the faithful have stood up against tyrannical governments and religious false teachings from Moses and Egypt, the apostles against Rome, Daniel and his companions against Nebuchadnezzar. Queen Mary asks, do, then, do you think then that subjects having the power may resist their princes? John Knox, if their princes exceed their bounds, madam, no doubt they may be resisted even by power. Consider, for example, that God has commanded children to obey father and mother. But the mother, the father, may be stricken with a frenzy in which he would slay his children. If the children arise, join themselves together, apprehend the father, take the sword from him, bind his hands, and keep him in prison till his frenzy is overpassed. Think ye, madam, that the children do any wrong? It is even so, madam, with princes that they would murder the children of God. They are subjects unto them. Their blind zeal is nothing but a very mad frenzy, and therefore take the sword from them to bind their hands, cast them into prison till they be brought to a more sober mind is no disobedience against princes but just obedience because it agreeeth with the will of God. At these words, the queen stood as if were amazed, stood for more than a quarter of an hour, her countenance altered so that John Knox began to entreat her and demand, what hath offended you, madam? At length, she said, well, then I perceive that my subjects shall obey you and not me. They shall do what they list and not what I command, and so I must be subject to them and not they to me. John Knox, God forbid that I ever take upon me to command anyone to obey me, or yet to set subjects at liberty to do what pleaseth them, my travail is that both princes and subjects obey God. Think not, madam, that wrong is done you when you are willed to be subject to God. It is he that subjects peoples under princes and causes obedience to be given unto them. Yea, God craves the kings that they be foster fathers to his church and commands queens to be nurses to his people. This subjugation, madam, unto God, 
and unto his troubled church is the greatest dignity that flesh can get upon the face of this earth, for it shall carry them to everlasting glory. This was not the last time that Knox and the Queen would debate together. In fact, he was summoned a total of five times to provide a defense for his preaching against her authority, the authority of the Roman Church, and against the growing Anglican Church. Knox was notable not so much for the overthrow of Roman Catholicism in Scotland, but more for assuring the replacement of the established Christian religion with Presbyterianism rather than Anglicanism. And it was thanks to Knox that the Presbyterian polity was established, though it took 120 years following his death for this to be achieved in 1689. So we have before us to put together this variety of scriptural and historical statements to explore and try to merge into some sort of cohesive understanding. We began this morning with Jesus' teaching to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's, recognizing that there is a submission asked of us to maintain a lawful obedience to authority, both political and religious. Government will make demands of us, as also will God. Then Timothy is urged in his life of ministry to live a life of prayer. Pray for all, even all in authority, for God wants to save all in Jesus Christ. God calls us to offer prayers and thanksgivings for everyone, noting specifically kings and all who are in high positions so that we might lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity. And so add to these exhortations this Reformation history layer of how we Presbyterians have as a core to our heritage protest, civil disobedience, uprisings, even war. No king, no people, no, no, no king, no pope, no bishop. That's, that's who we are. So this is not just a political statement, but a theological one. That God calls us to fidelity, and often we are called to stand against powers that challenge the sovereignty of God, even when those powers may be religious. So how do we reconcile these three understandings? Are they in opposition or in agreement with each other? Well, I believe them to be in agreement because that's where the power of prayer comes in. Our text in the letter to Timothy, calls us to pray, to experience the power of prayer, to live lives of gratitude to God through prayer, and to pray for all, even all in authority, for God wants to save all, and Christ Jesus gave himself as a ransom for all. We believe that there is no power greater than the power of prayer. For prayer is participating in the activity of God. We're told this is a right and acceptable way to be before God in prayer. That prayer is part of God's salvation plan even. It is God's desire that all should be saved, Paul reminds us. And we are reminded that all are redeemed according to the mediation of Jesus Christ, so that by, pa by prayers and supplications, we offer for those, even in authority over us, we participate 
in God's redemption plan. Now, I don't doubt for a minute that a minute that John Knox prayed each and every day for all and for all in authority also. Praying for God's wisdom and direction, praying for redemption and reconciliation, praying and learning to see others as God sees them. This will lead us to some pretty amazing perspectives. Now, admittedly, we are not easily or naturally ones who submit. But that's what prayer is. It's an act of submission. We submit to God's power and authority over us, praying, Thy will be done. As we bring to God our humble intercessions and grateful thanksgivings, and praying for others, especially for those we disagree with, results in another act of submission. We offer prayers of compassion. We seek understanding when we bring before God those who have seemingly harmed us, offended us, or with whom we simply disagree. The fourth century church father, John Christendom, wrote, no one can feel hatred towards those for whom he prays. Do you pray? Do you pray for those you agree with as well for those you don't? Do you pray that God's will be done even in the absolute confoundingly divisive and seemingly unproductive society and government that we find ourselves in. Whether you're a Democrat or Republican, you have to admit that there are serious enough problems on both sides of the aisle. Yet our God calls conservative evangelicals to pray for their liberal brothers and sisters and vice versa. Democrats in our congregation are called to pray for Republicans those who are upset about change in the church, the church that they have loved and served for years are called to pray for those who might suggest the church develop new ways to reach a changing community. And not only are these people called to pray for one another, but their prayers will hopefully lead them, as Christendom noted, to love one another. Render unto authority what they deserve, and to God what God deserves. Sometimes in prayer, you may be led to see that authority deserves the loving resistance. Submission to God in prayer may very well lead you, as history has shown, to stand up to cry out, to work, to make our society a better place, to take a stand. And so in praying for this world and for God's will to be done, God may call you to live out your prayers by becoming actively involved. Remembering that what God ultimately desires is that all might receive redemption in Christ. So let love be your motivation. Let your perspective of the world be informed by how God sees the world. For God looks out on this world that God created in compassion and love and mourns over its disobedience. God so loves this world that he gave his only son and whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life for God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world but through the son the world might be saved 
So in this world that seemingly each and every day is tearing itself apart through disagreement, misunderstanding, corruption, hostility, war, abuse, and hatred, don't you think that the best answer begins with living a life of grateful prayer? Don't you think we all could use a little more prayer, a little more compassion? Again, I believe there is no power more effective nor greater than the power of prayer. For prayer is seeking a God-given perspective and loving others as God loved them. May it begin with us. Let us pray. Gracious God, indeed, you have given this world to us as stewards that we might be grateful and see it as a blessing to serve and to love, that we might be grateful through our lives of prayer, praying for all those we love and those who have hurt us, for those who we agree with and for those we disagree. Use our prayers to change us, that we might be more loving and compassionate, understanding, forbearing, and use our lives of prayer, O oh God, that we might transform this world into one that is more loving and compassionate, forbearing of each other. Show us, O oh God, as our ancestors did, when necessary to stand up for what is right, to submit only to you, but make a stand for justice, righteousness, love and peace. May that be our prayer. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.